John Lewis, an icon of the civil rights movement and a 17-term Georgia congressman, died on July 17th of pancreatic cancer at the age of 80. Widely respected across the political spectrum, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor, by President Barack Obama in 2011. He's being widely eulogized, and we thought it would be appropriate to re-air the 2012 interview he gave this program about his memoir, Across That Bridge, so you could hear Congressman John Lewis in his own voice. Congressman John Lewis, why did you name your book Across That Bridge? Well, during the past few years, I've been crossing bridges, rivers, many bridges, Bridges of understanding, building bridges, trying to bring people together to create what I like to call the beloved community. Where does the Edmund Pettus Bridge come into that picture? Well, the Edmund Pettus Bridge is symbolic of so many bridges, but in 1965, when I was much younger, and head of an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a group of young people, students, and others, attempted to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, to march 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery, to dramatize to the nation and to the world that people wanted simply to register to vote. We were walking in twos, and when we arrive at the apex of the bridge, down below we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. And we continued to walk, and we came within hearing distance of the State Troopers. And a man identified himself and said, I'm Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march, and it would not be allowed to continue. And one of the young people walking beside me said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, Troopers advance. And they came toward us, beating us with nightsticks and bull whips, tramping us with horses and releasing the tear gas. At the foot of that bridge, I was beaten. I thought I was going to die. I thought I saw death. So at the foot of that bridge, I gave a little blood to make it possible for all people to be able to participate in the democratic process. So the book is just a symbolic bridge of many bridges that we still must cross, rivers that we still must cross before we build a beloved community, or a truly democratic, multiracial, society in America. Did you ever look up who Edmund Pettus was? I did look up uh, and discovered uh, this man, uh, Edmund Pettus, um, a general uh, in, in, in Alabama. You know, the bridge, this particular bridge was dedicated the same year that I was born, in, in 1940. So I have a kinship to this bridge. And every year, sometimes more than once a year, but every year, I make it a point to go back to that bridge and cross that bridge. And for the past 47 years, I've gone back the weekend, the first weekend in March since 1965. How, how did it fit in with everything that was going on back in the 60s? In order to travel from Montgomery to Selma, you had to cross that bridge. You had to cross the Alabama River. Selma was in the heart of the Black Belt of Alabama. That's where hundreds and thousands of poor black people live. They had been sharecroppers, they had been tenant farmers. But this little town, Selma, was a place of commerce. And people would come down on a Friday and Saturday uh, to shop. But in Selma, people could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. 
only 2.1% of blacks were registered to vote. You had to pass a so-called literacy test. On one occasion, a man was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap. On another occasion, a man was asked to count the number of jelly beans in a jar. People stood in what I call unmovable lines. The only time you could even attempt to go down to the county courthouse and go up a set of steps through a set of double doors and get a copy of the so-called literacy test and the application was on the first and third Mondays of each month. And on occasion, the registrar would put up a sign saying the office of the registrar is closed. And people went there day in and day out, standing in line. People were beaten, some arrested, and jailed while they stood there. Today, the mayor of Selma is the second African American to have that job? Um, the mayor of Selma is the second African American mayor in, in that city. The city council is, is a biracial city council. The police chief is an African American. Uh, Selma is a different place today. It is a better place today. What happened to you after you were beaten? Where, where'd you go? I, on that Sunday afternoon, I was beaten. And 47 years later, I don't recall how I made it back to the little church that we had left from. But apparently someone literally carried me back to the church. Uh, I felt like I was going to die. I do recall, uh, I thought I saw death. I really thought I was going to die. But I do remember being back at that church, the little Brown Chapel AME Church in downtown Selma. The church was full to capacity. More than 2,000 people on the outside trying to get in to protest what had happened on the bridge. And someone asked me to say something. And I stood up and said, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to vote. And the next thing I knew, along with 16 other people, I had been transferred to the local hospital in Selma, the Good Samaritan Hospital, that was operated by a group of nuns. And these wonderful sisters, they took care of us. And today, many of those sisters are retired, living in Rochester, New York. And uh, I, I plan to go there to visit them within the next few days. Anybody severely wounded that they didn't get out of the hospital for a long time? There were people who stayed for a few days, a few weeks. I got out within uh, two days. Any of the names that were around you, uh, would they be familiar to us, the people you marched with? Well, I, I marched with, uh, uh, later, not on that day, but later uh, during the week and, and the following weeks, uh, with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Dr. King came t to the hospital to, to visit us the next day. And he said to me, he said, John, don't worry. We'll make it from Selma to Montgomery. He told me that he had made an appeal for religious leaders to come to Selma. And two days later, more than a thousand priests, rabbis, nuns, and ministers came. And they marched to the same point where we had been beaten two days earlier. And one young minister went out with a group that fallen Tuesday evening to try to get something to eat at a local restaurant. They were attacked by members of the Klan. He was so severely beaten, the next day he died at a local hospital in Selma, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, rather. He was from Boston, Reverend James Reed. So when was it that people could leave Selma, walk across the bridge, and go all the way to Montgomery and not get hassled? We went into federal court and got an order against Sheriff Jim Clark, who was the sheriff of Selma and Dallas County, and against Governor George Wallace. And a federal judge issued an order saying that we had a right to march. 
President Lyndon Johnson came and spoke to a joint session of the Congress eight days after Bloody Sunday and condemned the violence in Selma, introduced the Voting Rights Act. And before he concluded that speech, he said, and we shall overcome. We call it the we shall overcome speech. It probably was one of the most meaningful speeches any American president had delivered in modern time on the whole question of civil rights. Of on that rights. note of we shall overcome, uh, you mentioned in your book about Rosa Parks and you go back to her training. You say that she wasn't trained I mean, that when she sat in that bus and wouldn't get up, that she had earlier training for that in Tennessee. Can you tell us about that place? There is a little school at that time, a little school did exist uh, in Tennessee, in a little place called Mont Eagle, Tennessee. It is between Nashville and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it was called Highlander Folk School. It was started by a guy, a, a, a brave and courageous white gentleman by the name of Miles Horton. It was a wonderful place and he was a wonderful, wonderful man. It was to train uh, and organize union people, uh, many white workers. And then he started working in the whole area of race relation, bringing black people and white people together. It was one of the few meeting places in the heart of the Deep South where blacks and whites could meet. And he started training people there how to organize, how to become community organized, how to protest. And that's where we start singing, we shall overcome. That's where Rosa Parks heard it. Rosa Parks said, it was a Highlander folk school where she had her first meal with someone of a different race. It was also for me the first place that I had a meal with someone white. But we worked together, we studied together, and we studied the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. We studied what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was all about in Montgomery. Uh, we studied Thoreau and civil disobedience. So we were prepared when the sit-ins came in the Freedom Ride, and by the time of, of Selma, we were more than prepared. So Rosa Parks, what was it, 1955, the bus incident? Uh, Rosa Parks took a seat on December 1st, 1955, in downtown Montgomery, and that led to the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and 56. You'd have been 15 then. I was 15 years old, and, and I remember like it was yesterday. I, I heard about it on the radio. I read about it in a local newspaper. Well, we were too poor to have a newspaper subscription, but my grandfather had one. And when he would finish reading his newspaper each day, we would get his newspaper, and we would read his newspaper. And I followed the drama of the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, when I was growing up and, and visit the little town of Troy, Alabama, or visit Tuskegee, or visit Montgomery, and see those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting, and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But it was individuals like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr and others that inspired me to, to get in trouble. And today I call it good trouble, necessary trouble. You say in your book that uh, you were in 40 different prisons or 40 different times you were behind bars. Can you tell us about some of those? The first time I got arrested was in Nashville, Tennessee. I was a student there. At Fisk? I was a student at Fisk. I first attended a little school called American Baptist College for four years, and then Fisk for two years. I spent six years in Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee was the first city that I lived in. I grew up in rural, rural Alabama. And going off to school there, I, I wanted to find a way to get in the way. I wanted to find a way to do something. Uh, when I heard Dr. King speaking on old radio, I felt like he was speaking directly to me, saying, John Robert Lewis, you too can do something. You can make a contribution. So. Going to Nashville and to Highlander Folk School prepared me to find a way. 
and I got involved in the sit-ins. How did you know about Highlander Folk School? Attending meetings in Nashville, attending school, a church, and people would say you can go to Nashville, and from Nashville you can go and visit Highlander Folk School. They're training people, they're teaching people, and when I got a chance to go with a group of my schoolmates and classmates, I made the trip there. And it was there that I literally grew up. It taught me how to be prepared to sit in. It taught me how to help organize. It, it, I grew up, I literally grew up at the age of 18 and 19. Was Marion Barry at Fisk when you were there? Marion Barry was a graduate student at Fisk University when I was in Nashville. Um, he attended some of the first nonviolent workshops, and uh, he later became the chairperson of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But he participated in the very first sit-in, the test sit-ins. We had what we call test sit-ins in Nashville in the fall of 1959. Students from Fisk University, Tennessee State University, Vanderbilt University, Peabody College, Bahari Medical College, and, and American Baptist. And we, we had to test the facilities just to establish the fact that we would be served or denied service. It was an interracial group of black and white college students. Why did you major in philosophy and do you have a favorite philosopher? I, I majored in philosophy. Uh, I was interested in becoming a minister. I, so I studied philosophy and, and religion. Uh, long before I went off to school, uh, I had this desire, this burning desire. Some people call it a, a, a calling, that you're called to preach, uh, 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 you're moved by the Spirit. But I felt I, I needed to be trained. Uh, when I was a little boy, I, I used to, uh, from time to time, uh, play church as a very, very, very young child. And it was my responsibility on the farm to care for the chickens, to raise the chickens. So we would gather all of our chickens together uh, in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and my cousins uh, would uh, help make up the audience, make up the congregation. And I would start speaking or preaching. And when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produced eggs. But those chickens taught me patience. And by the time I got to Nashville to school and, and the movement, I was prepared, I was ready to sit there, to sit in, to wait and wait all day until late evening to be served. And we were denied service and we were arrested and we went to jail. The first time I got arrested was on February 27, 1960. And when I was arrested, I felt free. Where did you go? I was taken, placed in a, in, a, in a wagon, and from that police wagon, a van, taken to the city jail with 88 other students. What's the longest time you ever spent in a prison? The longest time I ever spent in, in a prison was in Mississippi. Parchment? Uh, it was in parchment. In parchment, it was no one, no one in their right mind want to go to parchment. Tell us about parchment. Parchment, you know, people write about parchment. In, in, in novels, plays, poems, parchment was known as sort of no man's land. People go there and some people didn't return. I remember so well after staying many days in jail in Jackson, Mississippi, the city jail, the county jail, and then been taken down to Parchment. 
Who did? Were there others that we would know that were with you at the time? One of the young people that went to jail with me in Parchman was Bob Filner. He's a congressperson from California. He was only 19 years old. I was 21 at the time. But there was individuals like the Reverend James Lawson who became one of our wonderful teachers of the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. Um, Bernard Lafayette, James Belva, Diane Nash, these are all young people in the movement that were men and, and women that got arrested and went to jail. William Sloan Coffin got arrested and went to jail. There was lawyers, ministers, rabbis, priests. They, people came from all over the country. They couldn't take seeing people being arrested and taken to jail simply because they wanted to be served at a lunch counter, a ride together on, on a bus. You didn't tell us who your favorite philosopher was. My favorite philosopher, when I was studying, was Hegel. Hegel uh, uh, talked about the thesis, the synthesis. He talked about the struggle between good and evil. That in society, if you're going to bring about change, there must be a struggle. And there must be a division between the forces of darkness and the forces of light, the forces of good and the forces of evil. And somehow out of that evil and, and, and good, something wholesome must emerge. And in the final analysis, you got to move toward reconciliation. So in, in, in the book I talk about, in the very last chapter, I talk about reconciliation. O on the Freedom Rise, in, in May of 1961, my seatmate was a young white gentleman. The two of us arrived at a little bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina. We were beaten, left bloody, left in a pool of blood. And one of the young men that beat me on May 9, 1961, came to my office in Washington in February 09. Edwin Wilson. Yes, Edwin Wilson, Mr. Wilson, came to my office with his son, who had been encouraging his father to seek out the people that he had abused and attacked during the 60s. He came and said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that attack you, that beat you. I want to apologize. Will you accept my apology? Will you forgive me? He started crying. His son started crying. I started crying. He hugged me. I gave him a hug. He called me brother. I called him brother. And since then, I've seen this gentleman four more times. That was moving to a reconciliation. And even today, when I go back to places in Alabama, other part of the South, young people, people not so young, some older people, white people of the South come up and say, Mr. Lewis, Congressman Lewis, I want to apologize to you on behalf of all of the white people of Alabama, of the South, for what we did. Mr. Wilson and you were in confrontation physically where he assaulted you where? Mr. Wilson uh, beat me, knocked me down, left me bloody at the Greyhound bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It was about 35 miles from Charlotte, North Carolina. What was the occasion? We were traveling through the South as part of the Freedom Riders traveling on a Greyhound bus and some on a trailway bus. Back in 1961, after you left Washington, D.C., black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a bus, couldn't use the same waiting room, couldn't be seated together at a lunch counter in a restaurant, couldn't use the same restroom facilities. We were testing a decision of the United States Supreme Court, trying to make it real. And people 
not just in South Carolina, but in Alabama. People beat us. The Greyhound bus station in Montgomery left us bloody. They tried to bring down a church with hundreds of people in it that came to salute the Freedom Riders. And we were trans, we rode on to Mississippi. And in Jackson, we were arrested, hundreds of us. We filled the city jail, the county jail, and later we were transported to the state penitentiary at Parchment. How long were you in Parchment? I was in Parchment for about 40 days. What impact did it have on you? Parchment gave me time to reflect, gave me time to contemplate gave me the sense that I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, and I shall not be moved. It, it gave me a greater sense of determination and stick to itness. that when I got out, I was going to continue to do what I could to end segregation and racial discrimination in the American South. You've been in Congress how many years? I've been in Congress at the end of this year would be 26 years. How did your autobiography do? We were last together talking about that a number of years ago. Still selling? But the autobiography, memoir, Walking with the Wind, it's, it is still selling. It is doing very, very well. As a matter of fact, in many high schools and some colleges and universities around the country, it's required reading. Why did Mr. Wilson come back to reconcile with you? What triggered it? I, more than anything else, I believe the election of President Barack Obama moved him. But it's also the influence of his son. His son wanted his father to be on the right side. And the father really wanted to be on the right side. This man is a wonderful, wonderful human being. He, he, he took a lot of heat for having the courage to do what he did because the local press back in Rock Hill and then he was on national television and so people saw it. He got telephone calls. But he's a, he's a brave and courageous man. He said it was the right thing to do. And he's very, very sincere. And uh, he, he made me feel freer and just meeting him, he, he was the very first person to come to me and apologize, really. I want to show you a different person in the movement. Uh, this goes back to 1966, and it's a part of a speech that he gave, and I want to ask you the contrast, because you were both head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Let's, let's watch this. If black people control Lowndes County, They've got the tax assessor, the tax collector, and the guns, the sheriff. They're going to raise the property tax. Since they don't own property in Lowndes County, white people either go sell or pay the taxes, and we can all go on welfare for a decent salary. And it becomes crystal clear to me that if you had black people who were responsive to the Manhattan, where they control it since they're 60%, they can then begin to change the economy of that country. And the pressure that black people will fight for will in fact motivate and move the rest of this country because this country moves precisely because of the civil rights movement. That's why this country must stop it. Johnson must stop the civil rights movement because it is the biggest threat to his great society. <laughs> a man that looked at life a little bit differently than you did. Did you get along with him? I got along with uh, Stokely. Um, he came south during the fall, uh, late summer of 1961, uh, during the Freedom Rides, and later came back during the Mississippi Summer Project uh, in 1964. But I don't think Stokely ever understood the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. He never made that commitment. He grew up in New York City, uh, attended Howard University. And I think those of us who grew up in the heart of the Deep South, who came under the influence of Martin Luther King Jr., 
and individuals like Jim Lawson, who had a sort of a baptism in the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We took the long, hard look. We believed that our struggle was not a struggle that lasts for a day or a few weeks or a few months or a semester. It was a struggle of a lifetime. And I said then, and I said even today, that you have to pace yourself for the long, hard look, the long, hard struggle. And you have to come to that point and accept nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. Our struggle was not a struggle between blacks and whites, not a struggle between people, but a struggle between what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, between the forces of justice and the forces of injustice. In the movement, during the time when I was chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and in the movement itself in general, we call ourselves a circle of trust, a band of brothers and sisters. When someone got arrested with you, went to jail with you, someone beat him with you, almost died with you, you forget about race and color. How did the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee start? and who funded it in the early days, and where did it start? The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee grew out of the city movement. There was a young woman by the name of Ella Baker. She was not that young at the time, but she was young and hard. Now deceased. Now deceased. She was working for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as his executive assistant in Atlanta, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And when the city started spreading all across the South, like wildfire, Dr. King requested of her to call these young people together from the different college campuses and have a conference. And she made the decision to hold this conference Easter weekend, April 1960, at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the reason she went to Shaw University, she knew the school because she was a graduate of uh, Shaw University. She had worked for the NACP, she had worked for the YWCA, for the NACP. She, she was just one of these smart, gifted women that knew everybody, and she pulled this conference off, and all of these young people, but many, not just black young people, but many young white people. Was she white or black? She was black, uh, but she had many, many allies in, in the white community, friends, in the civic and social and religious organization. And it was in that meeting that Dr. King thought that the students would become the youth arm or the student arm of his organization. But she insisted that we make up our own mind and create our own organization. So the organization was called the Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Marion Barry, who had been a graduate student at Fish University in Nashville, became the temporary chair of the Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, April 1960. And later, there was a fall meeting in Atlanta on Morehouse College campus, where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee became a permanent organization with Marion Barry as the chair of the organization. James Clyburn, who is now in the Congress, was one of the students from South Carolina who attended the meeting with us in, uh, in Atlanta in October 1960. And his daughter is now a member of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, his daughter is, uh, is a member of the Federal Communication Commission. Mignon. Do you, um, I, I want to show you some more video of Stokely Carmichael because I want to ask you what what years later I, I think I did the last interview with him and he died in, back in 1998 99 uh, his name then was Kwame Toure and in this interview you'll see um, I ask him about uh, his career and all that let's watch a little bit of what he had to say and uh, tell us why he went one way and you went another both worked. You know, for me, uh, the difference here must be clear between King and I. We started to, to talk about it before and precising the uh, black power. 
But uh, as we said, King took it as a principle. As a principle, being an honest man, which he was, King had to use it at all times and under all conditions. For us, Narva is a tactic. If you go back and look at some of your documentation, you will see me in Narva. Uh, I've been beaten. I've been sent to hospitals on Narva demonstrations, and I've never broken Narva demonstration. Only once in my life, and that was on the Mississippi March when the policeman pushed Dr. King. Have I ever broken a nonviolent discipline? So uh, I accept it, you know, but if it's no longer working now, I'm not going to, uh, like Dr. King, to become hostage to uh, what I consider to be a tactic as a principle. I'm not pick up guns. I'm convinced that the stoker never, never, ever allowed himself to adhere to nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. He saw it only as a technique, only as a tactic, as he said, only as a means to an end. But those of us who accepted the philosophy of nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living, we were saying, in effect, that means and ends are inseparable. That if you accept this idea that you're going to create the beloved community, if the beloved community is the end, if that is the goal, the methods, the means, must be one of love, one of peace. And if you accept this idea that in the bosom of every creature, every human being, that is the spark of what I call the divine, you, do, you don't have a right to abuse it. You respect the dignity and the worth of every person. And you, as Dr. King would say, hate, bitterness, is too heavy a burden to bear. Back in those early 60s, you talked a little bit about the Freedom Rides and about you being chairman of SNCC or SNCC, at the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, for three years? Yes, I served three long years as chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, longer than any other person. How big was the organization? The organization had uh, hundreds, hundreds of, of what we call members, and at one time there were staffers, but people would pay pennies. They were not people with uh, uh, a big salary. Most of the individuals got like maybe $10 a week and you got money for, for gasoline if you had a car and you had to drive someplace, if you had to fly someplace. But it was students from around the country and other organizations and individuals and groups that supported SNCC. It was a very poor organization. During your time, what's the biggest accomplishment you had? During the time that I served as chair, it was during the March on Washington. Um, how much did you have to do with it? I know you were standing on the steps there, but and you were how old on that I day? I was 23 in 1963 when I became chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And one of the first obligations that I had was to attend a meeting along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and several others with President Kennedy in June of 1963. And it was at that meeting that we told President Kennedy that we were going to march on Washington. I would never forget it. President Kennedy didn't like the idea of hundreds and thousands of people coming to Washington. He said, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder? We'll never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. And it was A. Philip Randolph, who we considered the dean of black leadership, it was a labor leader, civil rights icon, really, he spoke up and said, Mr. President, this will be an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. And we went around the country organizing, mobilizing, and we invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in issuing the call for the March of Washington. So it was 10 of us um, that spoke and considered ourselves the leaders of the march. I spoke number six, Dr. King spoke number 10. And out of the 10 people that spoke that day, I'm the only one still around. But I remember so well, after the march was over, after Dr. King had delivered that speech, 
President Kennedy invited us back down to the White House. He stood in the door of the Oval Office greeting each one of us. He was like a beaming, proud father. He was so glad that everything had gone so well. And he said, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, and you had a dream. It was my last time seeing President Kennedy. What's your reaction? This is not a positive, but what's your reaction to, uh, over the years, the King family uh, charging money for ability for somebody to look at the uh, I Have a Dream speech? I don't quite understand. I don't quite understand. I, can, I cannot make sense of that. Um, no, the speech belongs to the ages. Um, now, I guess any of us could uh, could charge for someone reading, uh, using a speech, but I'm, I don't know anyone doing anything like that. Will we, will we charge someone for the Gettysburg Address? Um, or for some inaugural address by president? It's um, at a State of the Union address. That speech belonged to history. Do you have any idea why? I, 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 I have never been able to understand that. I, I really don't. I, th I think it's very sad. I don't think Dr. King would be very pleased to know that his heirs charged for using his likeness, or, or using his speech according from an address. <coughs> There's another person that I believe was chairman of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commission, a guy named uh, committee named um, H. Rap Brown. H. Rap Brown. Uh, I never got really to know H. Rap Brown. Um, he came long after I was no longer there. Uh, I made a decision when I was no longer the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to leave because they laid down a, their commitment to the philosophy and to the discipline of nonviolence. And I didn't want to be associated with an organization or with a group that could not adhere and preach the philosophy. As you know, he's in prison for murder uh, since 2000, but I want to show, he, his whole approach was even more agitating than Stokely Carmichael. See, Lyndon Johnson, he can always raise an argument about law and order because he never talks about justice. But black people fall for that same argument and they go around talking about lawbreakers. We did not make the laws in this country. We are neither mor morally nor legally confined to those laws. Those laws that keep them up keep us down. You got to begin to understand that. For 400 years she taught you white nationalism and you left it up. You taught it to your children. You had your children thinking that everything black was bad. Black cows don't give good milk. Black hens don't lay eggs. Black for funerals, white for weddings. That's white nationalism. Santa Claus. A white honky who slides down a black chimney and comes out white. I have to say that last remark was interesting. A uh, white honky who slides down a black chimney comes out white. It's a lot of rhetoric. It's a, a lot of plain on word and very emotional. Did it work? And that, that was that was not that was not part of the snick that I knew. Um, what happened? Something 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 went wrong. Um, snick came to that point where, in my estimation, it was forced to die a natural death. Um, we were conceived in this whole idea of the building of a truly interracial democracy. that were black students and white students working together, building together, suffering together. You, 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 you cannot forget that in 1964, one year after I became chair, during the Mississippi Summer Project, that we recruited all these young people, blacks and whites, primary students, but lawyers and doctors and priests and nuns came to work in Mississippi during the voter registration drive. 
that state had a black voting age population of more than 450,000, but only about 16,000 were registered to vote. And these young people and people not so young came there to, to work in their freedom schools. And three young men that I knew, that I had met during the early part of the summer, Andy Goodman, Mika Scherner, White, James Shaney, African American, went out on a Sunday night, June 21st, 1964. They were detained by the sheriff, later taken to jail. And that same evening, they were taken from jail, beaten, shot, and killed. These three young men died there. The bodies were discovered six weeks later. And you cannot forget that that people suffered together, bled together, died together. And then how can a movement make that radical jump by 1967 or 1968? And, and people like Stokely and, and, and Rapp uh, came to that point where they were saying that all white people should leave SNCC, should leave and go and work in the white community. Um, our movement, was an interracial movement. It was not to be a movement where we expelled people, but it was all inclusive. By the way, in all of this, when did you meet your wife? Because I know you dedicated the book to her. I, I met my wife um, the end of 1967 at a dinner party. And uh, we started dating. Where was the dinner party? It was a dinner party. It was in Atlanta at a friend of hers' home. And there was a discussion about the civil rights movement, about uh, uh, Dr. King and, and the movement. And she defended. She was, she was a strong defender of the movement. And I guess that sort of warmed me toward her. And she was wearing a, a, a beautiful dress and it had the peace symbols. And I think that sort of grew me toward her. And I said to myself, this young lady would leave in peace. And I don't know whether it was planned or whether it was a conspiracy on the part of the host of the party that she would defend the, the, the movement and that she would wear this uh, dress with the peace symbol. But from that day on, we hit it off very well. She, you were 27. Um, were there people at that dinner party that were arguing against the movement? Well, there were some people who were not necessarily arguing against the movement, but there were some people questioning some of the tactics and techniques and, and where we were going. And, uh, there, there were people, but she was a strong defender. Uh, she, she grew up in Los Angeles. She had never lived in the South. Uh, she had attended um, UCLA, USC, and she had spent uh, two years in the Peace Corps. She studied to be a librarian. She came south to work at one of the universities, at Atlanta University as a librarian. And she had a tremendous amount of interest in the civil rights movement. And... Um, Do you have children? We, we have one son. He's um, in Atlanta. He's uh, take a great deal of interest in music and also in politics, but he's... He didn't want to run for any office. How much of Atlanta do you represent? In the present district, I represent all of the city of Atlanta, the entire city. Uh, well, most of the colleges like uh, Georgia Tech, Georgia State University, Morehouse, Spelman, Morris Brown, uh, Clark, Atlanta University, but also represent Emory, CDC, uh, major corporations are all in, in the district. It's a wonderful district, wonderful people. Let me read from your book in the introduction. Uh, remember how we thought the election of President Obama meant we had finally created a post-racial America, a place where the problems that have haunted us for a long uh, were finally silenced. 
Nobody says that anymore. We no longer dwell on that daydream. We were shaken to realism by the harshness of what we have witnessed in the last few years, the vilification of President Obama, the invisibility of the sick and poor, murder at the Holocaust Museum, and the shooting of Representative Gabrielle Giffords while she greeted constituents in a Safeway parking lot. In spite of the election of President Barack Obama, we're not there yet. We made a lot of progress. His election, a major step down a very, very long road. But we have not yet created the beloved community. People ask me all the time whether the election of President Barack Obama is the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream. I said, no, it's just a down payment. How, how painful is it for you to look back in your support of Hillary Clinton over Barack Obama? I, I don't feel I don't feel any pain. I really don't feel any pain. Um, what was what was the reason? I, I knew President Clinton. I knew Hillary. I've known them long before I ever met President Barack Obama, and they have been friends of mine. They've been supporters of mine. President Clinton came to Atlanta, celebrated my. Uh, birthday, my 50th, and then President Senator Obama came for my 65th, and he was still in the, uh, in the Senate. Um, but he's a good friend of mine, I'm still a good friend of President Clinton and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and President Barack Obama, we are like a family. And, and that's what the movement was all about. That we're, we're one family, we're one people, we're one house. We may have our differences from here and there, but we, we work through them. Let me read you another sentence. The President of the United States <clears throat> was called a liar during a joint session of Congress at a State of the Union address it was probably the lowest point of decorum I have witnessed in more than 20 years in the Congress. It was unreal. It was unbelievable. When I heard a member of Congress, it is, it is just, you know, you have your difference, you have your feeling, but respect the office of the president if you cannot respect the man. Let me show you some videotape I found in our archives. Just a second. President Clinton was impeached for lying about sexual involvement with an aide. Evidence is coming to light that Bush and his administration have lied to the world, and to date, little is being done about it. I ask you, which infraction is more serious and warrants our time and money for investigation? Again, Lodi, California. The, the chair would remind members that it is not an order to accuse the president of lying or stating intentional falsehoods, even if by innuendo. Further, a member may not read into the record the remarks of others if they would be out of order as spoken by the member. Thank you. But the President Bush's statements about children's health shouldn't be taken any more seriously than his lies about the war in Iraq. The truth is that Bush just likes to blow things up. Members are reminded not to uh, refer to the president in any personal way. Both sides do it. It is my hope that we all can come together and be a little more civil, be a little more human. That's what I'm trying to say in this book. Can, can, can we just, going back to Mr. Wilson, do, do we have the courage? Do we have the power? Do we have the ability? Do we have the capacity? Sometime, just to say, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Can we get along? Uh, leaders must lead. You know, people around the nation, around, they, they, they see us on C-SPAN. And Leaders must be a, a headlight and not a taillight.
in the chapter piece at the end, and we've got just a couple of minutes, I want to read a, a paragraph that you wrote and um, ask you how effective you think it is to get people to read this. I ask you to reach down inside yourself and find the truth your life is compelling you to see. That is your road to true peace and it is the beginning of the evolution of humankind. Because every change in the world starts within. It begins with one individual who envisions his or her micro-universe the way it can be and settles for nothing less. And as one individual moves toward the light, that light ignites more individual flames and eventually the revolutionary inner work becomes a transformative outer work that builds into a bonfire of light, the kind of light that can change the world. I believe that. I believe that one, one solitary individual committed to the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence can change others, a community, a nation, a world. You have to, you know, we used to sing a little song during the movement, this little light of mine, let it shine, I'm gonna let it shine. We have to let our little light shine. Not just in our little room, yes? Not just on Capitol Hill, yes? but in the larger world. And that's what we must do as a nation. Somehow we got to humanize our politics. Just be human. Humanize our institution. It's hard, it's difficult for elected officials to say, you know, I love you. Many of my uh, colleagues in the Congress, I think people think it's strange sometimes. I refer to them as brother. Hi, my brother. How you doing, my brother? How you doing, sister? Because I see ourselves as a family. And we have to be examples to the larger nation, to the American community, and to the world. You wrote about Spencer, Spencer Baucus in here, a Republican from Alabama. I, he was a wonderful human being. White? He's white, represent part of Birmingham, Alabama. I've heard him tell stories, wonderful stories, about growing up, the role that his father played. I, we travel together. Each year when I take black and white members, Republicans and Democrats, liberals, conservatives, back to Alabama, he always hosts us. We travel together to India to remember the fifth anniversary of Dr. King's trip to India. And he's, he's my brother. He's my friend. He's, my, he's more than a colleague. The name of the book, Across That Bridge, Life Lessons and a Vision for Change. Our guest has been United States Congressman John Lewis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be interviewed by you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. <laughs>